Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this uh, business breakfast thinking. I'm James Harding. I'm the editor and co-founder of Tortoise. And it's possible that it's just the change in the weather, but it's also conceivably the fact that when you wake up on a morning like this, for the first time in a long time, you begin to think, actually, there's such a momentum around tackling climate change that we might yet do it. And the reason for thinking that is... Firstly, we're joined by Keith Anderson, who's the chief executive of Scottish Power. Keith, thank you very much uh, for getting up and doing this. Uh, <laughs> You're welcome. Um, and, and as we'll hear, Scottish Power is one of those examples, in fact, still relatively rare examples of a company that has committed itself to the path on net zero and committed itself to a future renewables. And we're gonna understand a little bit both about how that works corporately, but how that works technically, i.e. where the investment goes and what the impact is on the environment. Um, I was saying to Keith just before we joined, I sort of whistled in just before we started, not least because you may have seen in the news this morning, the BBC had picked up on the IEA report on how you actually get net zero and a vision for investments in renewables, the uh, ele electrification of the sector, EVs, gas boilers, and we're gonna come to all of that with Keith. And perhaps too, I think, because we are launching today, or at least formally launching, our Accelerating Net Zero Coalition. And in setting up Tortoise, we always said that we were going to be interested in what happens next in the story, not just reporting what happens, but trying to understand the outcomes. And this is an unusual thing to do, as you can imagine, for a journalistic organization to try and build a coalition of businesses, of NGOs and policy making groups all around this same idea. How do you accelerate net zero? Um, we're going to be talking about it at our weekly lunchtime thinking and then this evening really looking at the 12 months. So not just COP, but into COP and out the other side. And so I really hope that what you're seeing is a newsroom that's trying to do something different, not just um, trumpet the reputational successes when people announce a commitment to net zero 2030 or 2050, I not just do the headlines and not just take that kind of instinctive journalistic skepticism and and kick the tires on every single announcement, feeling as though something must be amiss, feeling as though somehow it's not possible for us to achieve what so many people are working so hard to achieve, namely a move to 1.5 degrees. So I hope in the course of the day, you'll feel as though we are a journalistic enterprise really trying to understand what's being done, what needs to be done and what can be done in coalition with a group of many other uh, businesses, actually journalists too, and uh, and NGOs. And so in that spirit, we start today with a conversation with Keith. Keith, I should say, a thinking is quite a chaotic uh, exercise. Everyone's <laughs> all in. So that kind of I'm, suits me fine. I would be very good. So I'm going to ask you a few, a fair few questions, but along the way, my colleague Liz Mosley is here on the chat. People will kind of type things in. I'll try and bring them into the conversation. And over the course of the next hour, I hope we come away with, I guess, a more detailed understanding of how this transition works. And I wanted to start, if I might, Keith, by just talking about not the broader economic transition, but the corporate transition. When you set Scottish power on the path it's on, I can understand what the reputational benefits are, but I just wondered whether you talk us through what the internal financial obstacles are to setting a energy company on a path to net zero. Yeah, it's probably it's probably worth splitting that into two. Um, you know, and there's the, the there's the bit about what what is it we make, you know, in terms of electricity, and you know, when you when you look at net zero and you look at tackling climate change, you know, most countries most um, regulators uh, and uh, organisations look at it. They, they look at you know, electricity generation uh, as a big carbon emitting uh, source. They look at transport. They look at uh, heat, and they look at uh, food uh, production. Um, and those are the big, big categories. So the electricity generation, but and obviously we being a being a generator, that was one part of our, our transition and one part of our role. And very, very early in, in the transition, we kind of saw the changes that were going to be required and we saw the opportunity. So we actually started that about 20, 25 years ago. So our oldest wind farms are 25 years old now. Um, 
So we always wanted to get involved early in this shift and we knew the shift was going to take place. Um, and then, you know, if you go back 20, 25 years, we were actually predominantly a coal generating company. That's, um, that's what we inherited when we were created as an organisation. Uh, in fact, we operated all of Scotland's coal plant. And then um, five, six years ago, um, we shut down the last coal plant that we owned. Um, we shut down the last coal plant in Scotland and we became a 100% renewable generating company. So that's one bit of it. And, and um, Keith, and Keith so just to, just yeah. to, forgive me for interrupting for a second. Okay. In that, is there, we outside big businesses like yours assume that there's a trade off there, that in giving up that coal, that there was a there was a financial price that you had to pay, or was it all on the plus side? Uh, you know, there, you know there, there, there are trade offs because you you've invested in an asset, you own an asset, the asset has a value, the asset has a life. You could have kept running the asset and making money out of the asset and sweating more cash out of the asset. But our view, from a, a, a kind of medium to long term value perspective, our view was always moving to renewables uh, over the medium to long term generates and creates more value and, and we absolutely as a group the entire group we inherently believe that if companies countries communities uh, regulators actually take that medium to long-term view you generate value for everybody because you create investment opportunity manufacturing opportunity you create jobs not only do you create cleaner air, uh, cleaner air uh, and less pollution um, you actually generate economic wealth and you end up creating electricity that's cheaper as well. So there's actually a massive win-win-win if you do it and you, you approach it in the right way. I think the, the thing we often see uh, you know, around the world and in other organisations is a kind of reticence to look at doing it because it, it's seen as being a challenge, an obstacle, a cost. Actually, if you leap to the medium to long term, you see the benefit and the upside of doing it. So very much medium to long term upside uh, short term, yeah, there is some pain in doing it. And the, the other bit, the other bit, James, just briefly then is all the other stuff we do as a company, because that, that's not enough. Okay, I, I mean, I would love to sit and uh, pat myself on the back and say, there you go, tickety boo, got rid of coal, renewables generation, we've done our bit, thank you very much, go and look somewhere else. But like any company, we operate offices, we have vehicles, uh, we um, move about the country and move from country to country. Uh, and we do a whole lot of other things as an organization. So we've put in place um, science-based targets to measure in our entirety, what's our carbon footprint as an organization in this country and how do we get that to zero? So that's looking now at a new, um, we've looked at a new travel policy where uh, within the UK, we just don't use airplanes, stop, okay? Um, yep, you have to use them if you're going abroad, but you're traveling in the UK, we're going by train, uh, or we're going uh, by some other form of, of uh, low emission transport. Um, you start to change what you do about the fleet. So we are now in the trajectory for 2030. Uh, we will have an entirely EV fleet of vehicles uh, for, for moving about and shifting people about as well. So there's a whole lot of things, other things we need to do as an organisation as well. And Keith, I just want to go back just to coal, the, the phasing out of coal for one minute, because <laughs> one of the conversations we've had is that one of the projects that we're working on, my colleague Charles Wattel is working on, is around Asian coal. And yeah. the argument that you hear amongst energy producers in Asia is that, you know, what's available to you is just not available to them. There's, there's an enormous energy demand. And actually, you've got large parts of big cities that are not properly supplied with energy. It's not feasible to turn to wind. It's not obviously easy to be able to rig up solar. They continue to need to, to use coal. And I wondered whether or not there's anything that's a read across from the Scottish power experience that works in Asia, or whether or not actually their argument is fair. Yeah, look, I, you know, these arguments get really, really, really complicated. I think you know, that, and the, the kind of message we've always given out and the one we're continuing to give out, particularly in the run-up to COP26, because it's coming to Glasgow in the UK, is um, don't, let's not berate countries or berate companies, okay? Hitting people over the head is not the way to do this or trying to embarrass them into do it is not the way to do it. You know, our, our role as a company, I, I think our role for the UK and for the UK government is to show leadership, is to show here's how you can do this. 
Here's how you can make a success of it. Here's how you can structure it and create value for your economy and create jobs. And here's how you can do it and carry on uh, running successful industry and successful manufacturing and then help those companies, uh, help those companies and countries make that shift and start to make that shift. But it's not going to happen overnight. You know, and people often pull out your know, China and India as the big bad examples. But, you know, there's loads of other countries. We're still burn, burning coal in the UK. We are yeah. not holier than thou. OK, so we, we, we shouldn't act as if we're holier than thou. We understand what we're doing. We've set the targets in place. We've set the timelines in place. But for a country like the UK, it should be easier to show that leadership. And that's why it's so important we do it. And it should be easy for us to demonstrate, here's the size of the prize at the end of it. Here's how you can do it. Here's the success you can get out of it. And then use that as a way of encouraging others to follow you and to follow that route and follow that path. You can show them examples of regulatory frameworks, investment frameworks, competition frameworks that help you make that shift and help you drive that shift as well. Keith, I'd, I'd like to come to that. I'd like to talk a bit about the government's capacity to, to create markets. But, but before I do, if I might, I, I'm going to ask Kate Manners to, to weigh in. I don't know Kate Manners, but I have to say, just from her, the point she makes, I already like her in that she's managed to get to the politics of renewables, both on Scotland and the royal family, in one seamless question. So, um, Kate, I'm going to hand it over uh, over to you. Um, yeah, I can everyone hear me? I hope they can. Um, yeah, it was it was about whether or not um, Scottish Power's sort of long term shift to renewables was in some sort of way to support Scottish independence um, and to sort of create a market for Scotland um, when and if. Uh, the inevitable happens and then also the relationship with the with the crown estate in scotland which is slightly different to its setup uh in england and they just released well particularly in england they released their round of, of bids um for the north sea and i wondered what your view was on that and what scottish power's relationship is with those two things Keith, I'm with you. Go, I, well, look, 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 what a what a brilliant question! I've never been asked that before. It has to be said. If that's your, but I, I've resisted painting the turbines tartan. Uh, if that partly <laughs> answers your question, <laughs> um, but look, no, look, I think you know, Scot Scotland. Um, you know, you know, quite a number of years ago, you go back quite a number of years ago, and and, and obviously with devolution and the Scottish Parliament, Scotland set itself some slightly more aggressive targets uh, than the rest of the UK. And in fact, in the, the Committee on Climate Change report, when they produced that last big, big report a couple of years ago, they also suggested Scotland should be a bit more aggressive. Scotland's got some phenomenal advantages. Um, and I think, you know, the, the, to, to congratulate the Scottish government, and they, they, they are due congratulations, they've done a huge amount. They, they saw those natural advantages the country had, and they've tried to push and make the most of that. And they've done a fantastic job doing it. So they've created this environment, actually, where it's been faster and easier to invest in renewables and invest in that future to make the most out of that natural resource. I mean, I think if I remember, Scott, you know, Scotland has about you know, 20 to 25 percent of Europe's wind resource. You know, Scotland's got huge uh, tidal resource, etc. So there are some, you know, Scotland's got some brilliant hydro resource. So there's some great natural resources that allow Scotland uh, and should encourage Scotland to go faster. And it's been a good place to be. And, you know, the, Scotland as a, you know, as a country has, has control over its own planning uh, policy and planning issues. So that's allowed it to, to, to look at how it, it encourages development and where it encourages development. But there's a whole load of the energy policy still reserved down to UK government around your know, things like your know, contracts for difference or the renewables obligation mechanisms and some of the things that encourage investment aren't all um, devolved to Scotland. So, so it works in conjunction with the UK government uh, and politically that has worked really, really well and it's worked well for the whole of the UK. There's also been a massive programme um, you know, and, and just a, a, a couple of years ago we finished one, one huge bit of it, which is to restring the, the transmission infrastructure, and we've built a massive HVDC undersea cable from Scotland down into the north of Wales. And part of that is about allowing the shift of power and recognising we're changing how we generate power right across the whole of the UK from what were huge big old centralised coal stations at certain parts of the country 
to a much more dispersed, distributed uh, generating system of wind farms in more remote parts of the country. And we need to redesign the grid and shift the power about a different way. So it's, it's a massive big integrated programme, big integrated process. But I think you know, Scotland, Scotland's done phenomenally well at maximising and capturing the natural resource it has available to it and making the most use out of it. And that's a great place to be. Uh, Keith, can I just ask you just to answer the question, uh, and Kate, I'm sorry, I'm going to get this wrong because I don't know the detail on this. I think you were saying that the treatment of the Crown Estates around the Scottish coast are different from around the English coast. Is that what you were saying? Um, yeah. Uh, well, there's a, yeah, there's a, there's a, sorry, Kate, yeah, yeah, there's a, look, there's a, there's a Crown Estate England and Wales process and a Crown Estate Scotland process. So for the next round of offshore wind, uh, the Crown Estate down south, I uh, just ran round four um, and the, you know, there was a big auction and a big competition for round four sites and we're about to, to go into um, what's called the Scott Wind process, which is the, the Crown Estate Scotland working with the Scottish Government to do the next round of uh, site licensing for around Scotland and the process has been run slightly differently. It's been run slightly differently again for some very, very good reasons, just in terms of the state of development of the sector and what the government of Scotland wants to get out of the sector in terms of investment into manufacturing and investment into supply chain. And so the site and the, the, the site characteristics are very, very different as well. So you have to recognize that um, you know, building an offshore wind farm off the, the west coast of England, uh, you know, in and around the, the sort of East Irish Sea and Morecambe Bay, because of the continental shelf. Uh, you know, the structure of building, the characteristics of building, the seabed building is completely different than building off the east coast of Scotland. So again, you need to structure what kind of projects are you looking for, what size of projects, uh, the depth of the projects, are you looking for floating offshore wind uh, versus piled uh, foundations versus uh, tripod foundations. So the process has to be different uh, because of the, the, the nature and the characteristics of the landscape and the seabed but it's also different because of what you want to achieve in terms of the state of the industry and investment into uh, some of the port facilities and investment into supply chain facilities as well. Hey, did you just, just before I move on, did you, did you have a point about that? Were you raising a point about that the money that flows to the Crown Estates or the running of those auctions? You're muted, you're muted, Kate. Um, yeah, sort of both, because yeah, from my understanding, they work very, very differently. Um, sort of off East Anglia in comparison to up in Scotland. Um, so I wondered really whether this whole sort of move to renewables was in a way a sort of tandem with the different relationship the Crown Estate has with Scotland, um, because it seems to be sort of conducive to what they want to do. So it was sort of about um, their kind of relationship. Yeah, it's, it's no, I, I, you know, I don't, I genuinely don't think it's about politics. I, you know, I genuinely think it's about the, the difference in the, 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 the maturity of the sector and the difference in, in the fundamentals of some of the projects. So if you take round four um, down south, and, and in many respects, you know, round four was deemed to be a huge success because there were massive bids went in for some of the companies for the site licenses. Um, and you can pat yourself on the back and say, that's brilliant, it's a good answer, it's a good result, it shows huge investor appetite. Uh, it shows a huge willingness to, to, to pour money into the sector. Um, and those projects are probably easier and cheaper to develop than the projects that will be built off the coast of Scotland. And therefore, people can afford to pay more for a site license and therefore an auction and a bidding war for a site license is more conducive to round four. When you move to Scotland, a lot of the sites around Scotland will be into, into the territory floating offshore wind or very, very deep offshore wind. Therefore, it's a completely different commercial game. The, the commercial structure of what you would pay for a site license versus your development cost versus your construction cost versus your operating cost is an entirely different commercial model. And therefore, you know, I think that on its own says you should run a different process and you should do it in a different way. And then in addition to that, there is a there is a difference of opinion about what's the best way to encourage investment in supply chain, um, and how, how do you how do you make sure you get the best investment into uh, into supply chain around port facilities? Is it you know through that auction process and then taking some of that money and investing it, 
or is it through working with the developers and the supply chain companies? And instead of putting money into the licenses, you put money into developing facilities. So there are different ways of thinking about it. Kate, thank you. And Keith, thanks. Can I just ask you one thing about that, Keith? Is there, is there, do you think, a public policy row or argument coming over the money that goes to the Crown Estates in this process and the money that goes to the Exchequer? In that, as I understand the settlement that was made by George Osborne with the royal family, a percentage of the revenues that go to the Crown Estates stays with the royal, stays with the royal family. And no one could quite have predicted the value of these uh, offshore assets, these offshore wind uh, auctions. And do you think there's gonna be a moment where people say, hang on a second, it turns out these large blocks of what seem to be you know, national land are being auctioned off, but a percentage of it is going to the royal family. Is, that, is there a sense within the energy industry that that's an argument that's coming? You, you can ask me if I'm gonna stick a crown on top of a wind turbine mm -hmm. in a minute. Um, Look, I, 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 don't, I think the debate that's taking place just now is nothing to do with the, it's nothing to do with the government settlement with the royal family or the way the, the way those finances work. The debate that's taking place just now, you know, there is a genuine debate about all that money that's gone to to the crown estate, uh, you know, and into the government and in inverted commas. What's the best thing to do with it, um, and what's the best way to use it, and how do you, do you should you take some of it and channel it back into supply chain development? Okay, so. Could you use it? And the government are doing this, you know, and there's already a program on the way to do this where bays are putting some investment into uh, port facilities to encourage the redevelopment of port facilities and to encourage other industries and supply chain to, to invest in and move to those port facilities. That's a great thing to do, uh, you know, and that's a critical thing to do. And uh, you know, So there's certainly a debate to be had about how much money should you use to do that and how much of that money do you, that you brought in from auctioning those sites should you use into the future development of the sector uh, right. and to the development of manufacturing and creation of jobs in the sector? Okay, all right. Well, that's, I, I mean, I think uh, Liz, you may, my colleague Liz has shared in the chat this piece about the, the financial end of it, but that's a, that's a completely different element to it, which we should look into. Um, Keith, here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to talk a little bit about the the overall roadmap to net zero you, you may have seen yeah. actually you probably haven't because you were talking about a number of people are interested in renewables in scotland the, re the reaction of shareholders i'm going to bring some uh, uh people in to talk about that too but also the extent to which the renewable sector itself is is reliable and resilient so i want to ask about all of those things but but i mentioned at the start that you know this iea report has actually set out a a path to net zero. Its basic argument is that if we do what we're currently doing, we're not going to get there. But there are, it says, 400 milestones that can get you there. And it talks about removing gas boilers by 2025, end of the internal combustion engine on cars by 2035, a tripling to $4 trillion investment in renewables in the 2020s. And I just wondered whether you would do for us a version of this, a stand back, which is not necessarily from Scottish power's point of view, but from your own, yeah. said, here's the pathway to accelerating net zero. Here are the critical things that you need to look for that will be a measure of whether or not we're likely to get to 1.5 degrees or not. Sure, so um, let's do that. And I'll, I'll kind of make reference back to probably back to the, the Committee on Climate Change report that came out a, a couple of years ago. And that, that really, for the UK, that set out a, a fantastic roadmap uh, and trajectory. And I think there were a couple of really critical comments uh, and statements in that report, uh, one of which was you know, um, quite nice and quite simple, which was getting to net zero by 2050 is absolutely achievable. And it's absolutely achievable with the technology we have available to us today. Okay, So for the UK to do this, it can do it. And it has everything uh, at its hands and at its disposal to allow it to do it. Okay, right. If you break it down into the sectors, you break it down into the generation of power to transport, to heat, and to food. Okay, um, and in the if you go back far enough in time, I think you, know, you used to get people who who thought you tackled one, and then the next one, and then the next one, and then the next one. Everybody started with electricity generation because um, it's the least intrusive. You know, I um, switch off a coal power plant, 
blow the thing up, demolish it, build a couple of wind farms. Um, you're sitting there at home. It makes not a jot of difference to you in terms of what happens when you flick the light switch, turn mm -hmm. the oven on, charge a mobile phone. Yet when you get to transport, uh, then we're asking you to change the kind of vehicle you drive. When you get to heat, we're coming in and changing the boiler in your home. And then we start talking about food production and, 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 and food sources. We're starting to tell you what you should and shouldn't eat. It becomes more and more intrusive. Uh, and therefore, people saw it as, as some progression down that route. What's become clear to hit net zero by 2050, you can't tackle them in a serial way. You need to be tackling these all together now uh, and making progress on all of them now. Now, if we're a good start on electricity generation, it's fine. The trajectory for electricity generation is very, very clear. We just need to keep building more and more and more renewables. And as part of that, we need to invest in the grid system to allow the stability and, and allow the shifting of power. And we need to build more into storage to allow us to smooth out the power fluctuations and the, and the demand fluctuations. So, but we know how to do that. There's quite a clear path on how to do it. Transport, uh, relatively clear. Good thing is, you know, the UK government have now signalled by 2030 um, that you will not be allowed to buy a new petrol or diesel vehicle in the UK beyond 2030. Well, why is that important? Those kind of markers are really, really important. E even if you don't give all of the details about funding and financing, those kind of markers are really, really important because it sends an incredibly clear signal to the various bits of industry involved and the sectors involved in that there you go, there's the timeline, it is changing, you need to get ready for the change. And so it starts to steer investment decisions, it steers the, your people's mentality uh, towards that target and towards that date, and you see everybody shifting towards it, okay? It also then starts to open up the conversation to allow you to say, okay, for that to be realistic, how many charge points do we need to start installing? What do we need to do to the distribution system? Uh, to, to be able to provide the, the power to all of the places around the country to allow people to charge vehicles. What do we need to do to the public transport system? Because not everybody's going to be able to afford to buy an electric car. We need to electrify or car uh, decarbonize uh, buses, trains, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it starts that entire process and that entire conversation, which is great. And that's where the challenge comes with the next bit, which is heat. Because mm. we don't have that date. We don't have that target yet okay and there is still a big debate going on in the uk what's the answer to the heating system and this is a big some big challenge for the uk because about 80 85 percent of us heat our heat our homes by burning gas <clears throat> and that needs to stop now right now today the technology available to stop that um, is to electrify it. air source heat pumps ground source heat pumps but the target date and the framework's not there to drive all of that investment yet. The other alternative that people talk about is, is the use of hydrogen. It's some form of clean gas solution that you could use, okay? And I think the reason that still gets talked about and the reason the debate is still going on is because I think inherently in people's minds, they kind of think, well, if you could use a gas, surely that's simpler and easier to do because we already have a gas network to all of these boilers. And that's not necessarily the case. You know, the boilers on the wall in your home cannot burn hydrogen. A huge proportion of the gas network, you could not put hydrogen through it anyway. So there is still a wholesale infrastructure change, um, whether it's electrifying heat or putting a gas down the heat network. And right now, you know, my, my view uh, and our view as a company is we need to get on and start electrifying the heat system uh, in the UK. We cannot wait and continually have this debate and we cannot wait to see if some other whoopy doopy new technical solution comes along. You know, again, I would go back to that committee and climate change report. You need to start now, you need to start moving now and you have all the tools and technology available to allow you to deliver it now. And if you get, again, if you get those signals right, if you get those frameworks right, you can do the same as it's been done uh, with, with, with renewables and with offshore wind. You get a huge wave of uh, investment, a huge wave of innovation, and it drives down the cost. You're seeing the same thing on EVs. You set the target, there's a massive wave of investment coming across the auto manufacturing sector, and you're starting to see the cost of the, 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 the number of EVs available it is increasing exponentially, and you're starting to see the cost coming down. You know, most people are projecting 
that by 2023, 2024, EV and petrol cars will be a price parity there. Uh, and therefore you'll drive that change and drive that mentality. And it's about doing that. It's about creating that investment signal to drive down that cost. And then you, you know, we need to start educating people about food, uh, the food we eat, the food we produce, what we do with it, how we do that, uh, and the impact it has on the environment as well. But again, you're starting to see a huge societal change. You know, I, two of my daughters are vegan. They've been vegan for 10, probably 13, 14 years. Okay. And, you know, I remember when they first became vegan, uh, you know, it, it, it was tough. It was difficult. You know, you walked into a supermarket and you were wandering up and down the vegetable aisle because that was your whack. You go into any supermarket now and every supermarket is littered with plant-based food. Things are changing. Things are moving. Uh, people are adapting. And that, that's what we need to keep pushing, what we need to keep encouraging. So that's the kind of projected. But what you can't do is tackle them one after the other. We need to start all of them now and we need to start shifting them and go faster and faster. Another good example, even on the easier bit, on the renewables bit, just a quick statistic, you know, it's taken our company 20 years to do two gigawatts of wind. Okay, now I'm targeting our company to double that in the next five years. So double what it's taken us to do in 20 years and deliver it in five years. That's the kind of acceleration we need to see coming through the system. That's the kind of level of ambition we need to see coming through the system. So when you start to hear and see people like the Prime Minister putting out 10-point plans with huge, big, bold, ambitious targets, and some people are a bit sceptical, but that's exactly what we need. We need to be massively ambitious, incredibly bold, and we need to go faster and faster and faster and faster. And the pace has been way too slow. And that's where the next big challenge comes, which is it's great to set the ambition. It's great to set the big targets. But we've got a whole raft of processes in this country, whether it's the planning system, the environmental legislation, whether it's uh, regulatory processes and regulatory settlements. They all need to shift and change as well. And they all need to work faster and move faster uh, and, and be invested in as well to make sure they're fit for purpose. An awful lot of those processes were built for what we were doing 15, 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. oh, it's no good for today. What we need to be doing going forward is you're quadrupling the amount of renewables, uh, renewable investment in energy, and we need to do it five to 10 times faster as well. Keith, can I, I, want, I'm, I want to bring in there a host of people who've got questions and points for you. I just want to understand one thing on your heat point, because actually electricity sources, transport, heat, food is a really helpful way of thinking about it. But on heat in particular, Yep. your insistence that actually electrification is the way to go for domestic heating, does that mean that hydrogen is a false god? No, 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 not in the yarn. And this other thing is, which is, you know, this is, none of this, none of this is about uh, sitting on our bum waiting for some new invention, but also none of it is about discounting technologies that are there and are available. And, you know, the simple way I look at it, which is, we have an answer available to us today, which is electrify, let's use it. Um, at the same time, let's invest and continue to look at hydrogen. So there are some great projects, and we, we've got some as well, looking at using green hydrogen to decarbonize industrial process. And as you look at that and invest in that and develop that, you will again get a whole lot of innovation, you'll drive down the cost, you'll look at the possibilities that you are, you'll look at what it can deliver and what it can do. And that will help you to think about are there areas where the heat network, actually, it would be daft to electrify it. And the answer for parts of the heat network may well end up being uh, hydrogen because of the specific characteristics. So same with transport. Quite clearly, the answer for your car and my car is a battery, electrify, okay? But there are other bits of the transport sector, you know, like dustbin lorries, uh, long haulage transport vehicles, uh, heavy goods vehicles, but the answer might not be batteries, the answer might be hydrogen. And so there is plenty of space and plenty of room for other technologies to come along. But what you cannot do, and that's the main point I'm trying to make, and the biggest important, you cannot sit and wait and do nothing in the hope that there's a different answer 10 years from now. That's fool's gold. Keith, thank you. I'm going to, I'm going to start... Um, I want to come to 
um, Peter O'Sullivan and to Stephen on the reliability of the renewable supply. I'm going to come to Tess in a moment on investors and where they stand on this. I'm, I'm interested to come to Julianne on the question of nuclear and, and I'm going to come to Rachel on this planning question and, and new build and new homes. So, so can I start with Peter O'Sullivan because you mentioned fluctuations. I don't know, Peter, whether you're there and you can join us. There you are. Yep, thanks very much. Thanks, really interesting discussion today. Um, my question was, um, you know, looking at the picture nat nationally, one of the big issues is the seasonal variation in power demand. There's, there's over 10 gigawatts in, in, in the difference between winter and summer. Um, and so the question was, you know, as a fully renewable uh, power generation company, how do you accommodate that? Do you build, um, you know, enough renewable capacity to meet the peak? in winter or do you you know rely on interconnectors um, or what are your plans for storage because that seems to be one of one of the big problems in fully decarbonizing power in the country you know at, at the moment the the swing in demand is met by um, gas-fired power generation um, and if we want to get rid of all of that we have to solve this um, seasonal demand problem yeah look at uh, peter is a, a brilliant question and I, honest to God, I wish I could just give you a one word answer and tell you it's all okay. There are challenges out there. I, undoubtedly, you know, what I would do is put it in you know, put it in a wee bit of context, which is I, you know, I, because I've been kicking about this industry for so long. You know, I remember 15 years ago, people, people telling me that by the time we got to the level of penetration of renewables we're at today, the whole system would collapse and fall apart. We couldn't cope with it. We wouldn't be able to deal with it. You know, but through the investment we've made in the grid system, the investment we've made in the whole of the technology, we're quite easily managing the grid system and the fluctuations in demand. And you know, um, we had some interesting days over the last 12, 18 months uh, with the pandemic where demand levels were, were wavering about all over the place, um, uh, temperature changes, weather changes, and we managed all the way through the entire process and the entire system. One of the important things, and you, you, you talked about it, is storage. Um, but in all honesty, storage has been a massive point of debate going back 20 to 30 years in the UK as well, uh, when we were using the gas network, which was always this question, did we have enough storage in the UK? And as you look forward on the transition towards renewables, again, it's exactly the same debate. There's a storage issue. Uh, and you absolutely, undoubtedly, we need more investment in storage, as well as more investment in interconnection and more investment in grid flexibility. Um, they will become crucial, absolutely crucial. Now, we've got hydro storage, pump storage uh, technology, absolutely, it's there, it works, it's proven. Um, battery storage, you know, my personal view is it's more for short term uh, shifts and flexibility on the grid and on the network system but it can play a really big, important role in managing those short-term fluctuations and, and uh, grid stability. Um, and then we need to look at other uh, possibilities of storage, whether that's hydrogen storage, whether it's uh, compressed air storage, liquefied air storage, but again, other storage solutions as well to help with those shifts uh, in terms of either seasonal fluctuations um, or short-term demand fluctuations. We need to look at, at future investment. And the, the whole stability of the grid system in terms of the way we interconnect it across the whole of the UK, which is why we've been doing these bootstrap lines and the HVDC lines, but also then the interconnection from the UK to other parts of, of, of Europe uh, and to Scandinavia as well. All of that has to be part of the answer and part of the system. Keith, thank you. I, I sort of feel as though there's, uh, and Peter, thank you. I feel as though we're not, not doing quite full justice to that question because you feel as though there's a whole other discussion about future yeah, is, yeah. of energy. <laughs> you, but no, it just I, I feel as though we're at the moment where the map is getting remade of energy, who the supplier, yeah. how it's distributed, and we haven't begun to think about it. And I'm and I feel we're not going to because I want to make sure we get to some. <laughs> Julianne, can I can I just invite you in because you raised the nuclear question and we don't talk about it as much as we did. And, and Julianne, I wondered whether you wanted to put that point to Keith. If you're there, I don't know whether you can. Sometimes I see that you're on your iPad. Sometimes it's more difficult to talk on an iPad. Oh no, there you are. Hi there. Oh yeah. Hello. Um, I'm just wondering about where nuclear fits in with this. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, we can hear you. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, 
because uh, there is ongoing development, I understand still, which is in invested by, in, well, international investors uh, for some reason that was made as a choice. And, you know, there are dangers associated with um, nuclear, as we know. Uh, should we still be relying on nuclear? What, you, you know, what will the future be? Thank you, Luke, again, nu nuclear, it's a, uh, you know, it's a huge, huge topic and you could do an entire program all on its own just on, on the future of nuclear. Um, so I, 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 you know, I'm relatively technology agnostic. Honestly, it really doesn't. You know, as a as a company, we're not investing in new nuclear. Um, but th that doesn't mean I don't like it, or I don't want it, or I don't think it's good. Okay, I think there are some challenges around in future investment in nuclear, which is how do you how do you do it? Where does the money come from? How do you structure it? How do you pay for it? Uh, and how do you price it? Uh, because it kind of looks expensive. All right, and I think that's just part of the. I think part of the issue we've had over the last five years in the UK, five to 10 years around the nuclear debate is around the transparency of that conversation. So I think we just need to be very open and very clear. If we want to do it uh, and we think it needs to be part of the system, then quite simply, let's just be very open and transparent about here's what it's costs uh, and here's the ongoing running costs of it, et cetera. And we just need to deal with it uh, and need to price that into the system. I would kind of almost view nuclear more as almost like a regulated asset I don't really think it plays that well in a competitive market, given the costs and given the risks, uh, and therefore the you know the the, the issues it, it suffers from in a competitive uh, framework. Clearly, we have nuclear power uh, right now. We're building one new nuclear power plant, and the UK may build one more new nuclear power plant. I'm not too sure. I can see very many more than that being done. There is a little bit of talk. Uh, with companies like Rolls Royce and others about small scale modular nuclear power plants. Um, exactly where that is in the, the R&D timeline, I'm not too sure. Um, but nuclear is going to be here as part of our energy system for quite some time uh, in the future, because if you look at the one that's being built now, that's likely to be here in another 30 to 40 years. So it will be part of our energy system and part of what we do and part of what we use and part of what we price into the market. So it has it has a role uh, and it has a part to play. Keith, thank you. Uh, and Julianne, thank you for, for very much. I just wanted to um, invite Rachel Melson to... To, to talk to you a bit, Keith, about the subject you raised at the end there, which is changes to the planning system, the way in which we build our houses and our cities. R Rachel, are you there? Sure, yes, I'm here. I'm here. Um, Keith, I'm not sure this is a question that you're going to be able to answer on your own. I think it's probably <laughs> a combination of entities that need to come together. I wondered whether or not there was an opportunity to have a system whereby new build was automatically connected to an energy supplier that, by, that the default option was clean energy renewables. Obviously consumers are going to want to know that they can make their own choice should they wish to, but we all know how lazy we all are. So the likelihood of any of us changing once something is in place, especially if it's a beneficial yeah. option that comes at a, a cost effective price, that might be one route through. Now, and there's going to be government issues, there's going to be house builder issues around that. But I just, it was just a, a thought, it was just an idea. So, but I wonder what no, you think. No, uh, Rachel, that's a, it's a, a, a brilliant, again, a brilliant topic. And, and honestly, housing again, uh, you, you could spend an entire, an entire day having this debate. A couple of things to pick up on, though, and what you said, which are, are, are very, very relevant, which is about new, new build housing. And there's a couple of things there, which is the, the energy efficiency of new build housing and how energy efficient are the homes we're building. Now, they are clearly better than historic stock of housing in the UK. And we still have a massive issue with this historic housing stock in the UK and it's poor energy efficiency and how do you upgrade it and how do you improve it? But I would still say there's a massive debate about the energy efficiency level of new build housing in the UK. Just how efficient is it and should we be investing more money up front to make new houses even more efficient, which makes tackling climate change in the future even easier. Coupled with that, on terms of new build, before we get to the actual energy source, I think, again, to me, new build is a fantastic way of starting to tackle the heat issue, which is every new home that's being built right now in the UK, why are we still building new homes and fitting them with gas boilers? So should every new build house as of now be getting fitted 
um, with a, an electric uh, air source or heat source pump, okay, a uh, ground source pump, sorry. And actually you start making that shift because that creates a market for the investment in the technology. It creates a market for the innovation to drive down the cost of that transition and that switch. And, and you start that now. And yes, you can um, as well, if, if you're doing huge, big uh, new scale developments, then should you also be looking at linking that into, um, uh, into a, a fuel source, an energy source that's tied automatically to renewable, uh, to renewable sources and create that linkage up front as well. So I think you're absolutely spot on. It's those kind of areas and those kind of bold decisions that we need to start making uh, and we need to start shifting the market in that direction because that's what encourages the investment and the transition. And doing it with new build is a hundred, a thousand times easier than retrofit uh, of existing housing. Keith, thank you. And Rich, thank you, thank you very much. I just want to invite Tess Murray because Tess was asking Keith early on about investor attitudes to this. And we find it quite hard to work out what the truth is of the gap between what investors say and what they actually want behind closed doors. Tess. Hi, um, I'm really, really enjoying this. Thank you so much. But I, it's, as we always say, an hour is just not going to be enough, is it really? Um, I was wondering, since you started this um, early with investors, whether you felt that you had to sort of take them on that sort of journey whether there was a smoothing of returns that you had to sort of hold their hand through. And if you think that there's been a genuine shift away from sort of a fixation on short-term quarterly reporting and expectations around financial KPIs to a more long-term, wider um, expectation that financials aren't all you're going to measure a success of a company on now. Or whether, you know, I'm still, I'm still sceptical that, you know, if you set yourself non-financial KPIs, but the market's still going to beat you up if you don't meet your financial ones. Yeah, okay. So uh, that's a great question as well. Um, and, a, and a huge topic of debate. Right. I'll, I'll split that in two, okay? Investors' attitude towards uh, climate, tackling climate change and towards renewable energy and towards uh, all of the technology we need to, to start pushing um, has changed massively. Okay, and the simplest example is probably the likes of offshore wind. If you go back 10 years, the investment funds, infrastructure funds, wouldn't have come anywhere near an offshore wind farm until it was constructed, operating, and it probably had a one to two year track record. Okay, now, and if you look at round four and the site licensing, you have infrastructure funds, finance funds, investment funds, actually buying straight into projects before anything's been done, pre-planning, pre-development, pre-construction, pre-operation. The, the investment community is phenomenally comfortable with the technology and with the return you can make from that technology. And that's, that's a huge success story driven by the way the market was created in the UK and the frameworks that were created in the UK. And um, now that's also helped to drive down the cost uh, and the cost of money going into those projects. So that, that's a big, big success, right? Flip that to, to the other part of your question, which is then more about how do investors view companies, okay? And look, yeah, Tess, the, you know, the truth is, you know, we, you know, the Iberdrola Group is an organization. Yes, um, our investors love what we're doing. Yes, they love the, the transition to renewables. Absolutely, they love the projects we're investing in and building. Um, do they still look at our quarterly results? Do they still want us to hit our targets? Do they still expect the profit number to come through? Do they still expect the dividend? Yes, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. But we as an organization are comfortable that with what we're doing, what we're investing in and what we're building, we can still deliver that. So our investors can still look at us you know, as a utility. You know, And some people think utilities are a bit old fashioned and a bit boring, okay? But, Utilities are the new black, okay? We are the new energy majors. We're the new investment future. We're the big growth stocks, okay? Uh, and investors like us and investors love what we're doing. But yes, uh, as a utility, they still expect us to deliver everything we've told them and hit every target we've told them and hit every number we've told them. Thank you very much. Tess, Tess thanks so much. I just want to, I just want to, I started bringing Stephen at the beginning because one, one, 
thing we may be losing a little sight of is just the context of this. And Stephen was asking, I think, at the start, the, the extent to which Scotland as a whole is now turning to renewables. Um, Stephen, I don't know whether you're there. Morning. Yeah, hi. Hi, hi from Sydney, Australia. Um, hey, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I've looked up the answer in the meantime, which is a very impressive 97%, I think, Keith, uh, yeah. of Scottish generation comes from renewables today. Yeah, that's correct. So Scot Scotland as a whole, um, in Scotland right now, um, lots and lots of wind, some solar, some hydro. Uh, there is one gas plant in the whole of Scotland uh, and there's some nuclear in Scotland. So it depends how you, you want to add up the numbers and it depends on which day you look at, which period you look at in terms of what's outputting, <laughs> what's generating. But re regularly we are way up in the 90% in terms of renewable output uh, on the system. Uh, and can I, Steve, Stephen, th thank you. and. and and Keith, then can I ask you a question, which is, we, we have, and I suppose there's a newsroom, and, and journalists kind of reach for single levers to try and address this issue, particularly around acceleration of, on the net zero agenda, carbon prices and carbon tax. And listening to you, I come to possibly a slightly different view, which is, if governments step in and incentivize the creation of new markets, so whether it's around... Um, heating systems for homes or EVs or um, other, other consumer behaviours, if they create the requirements of those new markets, can they do as much as they could do by introducing a carbon tax or carbon price? Okay, right. So, wow. Okay, again, another, uh, uh, another big, big topic. But what, what I would say right now is, that, you, know, you know, if you take the UK uh, in and of its own, um, you know, carbon pricing is... You know, it's relevant and it's important. Okay. However, you know, right now there are other levers which I think are much, much more important around acceleration uh, and the push. So, simple, couple of simple examples. Again, I would give you um, the round, round four site licensing process that took place uh, a few months back, um, and you ended up with uh, companies bidding in quite significant sums of money to win a site in the UK. Okay, and I think um, there were five or six companies that were successful. Okay, there were probably about 25 to 30 companies that didn't win a site. All right, but that's 25 to 30 companies who were willing to invest in and build a two to three billion pound offshore wind farm in the United Kingdom. Wow. Now that tells me there are a whole lot of investors out there raring to go and a whole lot of developers raring to go to build more and do more. So the simple conundrum for the UK to, to, to unravel is how do you make the pipeline bigger? And so in that round, we had a pipeline that we gave out of site licenses of I think it was about six gigawatts. Quite clearly, there was appetite out there for 12, 18, 24 gigawatts. Why aren't we going faster and creating more pipeline and more project opportunity? Because clearly the investor appetite is out there and the developer appetite is out there. It's and the same with onshore wind and it's the same with solar. And that to me is a far faster, easier lever to pull than worrying about carbon tax and the carbon tax differentials from country to country. That, that's, you know, not, I, I, I wouldn't have thought one of those investors and one of those bidders was at all worried about the carbon price. What they were worried about and focused on and looking at was, can I get one of the projects? Do I understand the contract I get with it and the contract, the contract for difference mechanism? And do I understand the wholesale market in the UK? And do I understand the construction and operating risk? I think carbon price fell way, way, way below those in the decision-making process. So pull that lever to get a much faster answer. And Keith, is there, sorry, this is a really naive question, is there enough coastline, is there enough yes. space for 25 to 30, and is there enough connecting grid to enable those people oh. to put 25 <laughs> to 30 far? So there's a, ton of, there's a ton of coastline, let's not worry about the amount of coastline, there's loads and loads of space out there, and you can go out into deep water and we can do floating offshore wind, okay? So lots and lots and lots of space, right? Grid connectivity, is a huge, huge challenge, okay? And it's a challenge in lots of ways. One, we, we honestly, we're turning the entire system inside out, upside down. We're going from huge, big centralized generating plant 
and pushing it out to massively dispersed generating sources and pulling it back in. So we need to reinvent, uh, redesign and reinvest in the entire grid system. In addition to that in the grid system, the pool off it is changing massively. You know, yes, we're still putting the, the power into people's houses and businesses, but now all of a sudden we're going to be installed in, installing EV charge points. So a rough estimate, somewhere between 20 and 25 million electric vehicle charge points need to be installed across this country over the next 10, 15, 20 years. Um, you'll install heat pumps, somewhere around 24, 25 million heat pumps need to be installed around this country, across the whole of the UK. That completely changes the way you're pulling power off the system as well. It's another massive investment in the distribution system. So that grid system needs a huge amount of investment in going into it. And then if you look at the connectivity of offshore wind, right now we're using what you would call a point-to-point -point system. So every project out there builds its own offshore substation, and its own onshore substation and its own onshore grid connection. And what's becoming quite clear is that is inefficient. Um, you're going to upset an awful lot of people building substations onshore. So what we need to look at doing is making a, a, a loop, a ring system, where you collect three or four or five or six of those projects, feed it into one massive offshore substation and feed it into one connection point onshore. So we need a different way of doing that. A, and a way of making that simpler, faster, and more efficient as well. Well, Keith, thank you. Um, I see that we're coming towards the end of our hour, um, and I really did want to say thank you, actually, not, not just for sparing the hour to talk to us, but there are moments where one of the great things about being a journalist is you stop and you think, oh, I've just, I've just had a moment where I've seen it. I've seen that what, what the future might look like. And as you were talking, I was remembering when we used to get on planes, that experience, you, you, you fly out certainly certain airports in the UK, you come out over the sea and you see that, that, that amazing thing of windmills in the sea. Yeah. And you suddenly imagine <laughs> actually a future of the UK where there was much more of that, a different kind of, uh, a different kind of energy grid. And in the process of you talking about EV charging points and different heat capacity in homes, Actually, I almost became persuaded that utilities are the new black. I got that close. Oh, we are. <laughs> the, the, I'm the, telling you. <laughs> that, yeah. but, I, but, but the real point here, Keith, is I think I think for a lot of people, for example, particularly people who work in and around the news, there's been a decade in which there have been mostly politicians and some campaigners talking about the need to address the climate change oh. crisis and not a sense of practically what's happening. And in the last hour, both the way you framed it and the detail of it has given a sense of what can happen and what in fact is happening. And so for us today, thinking about how we build this coalition, what we can do to actually, as a journalistic organization, understand accelerating net zero, it's been a brilliant start to the day and given us, I think, a really granular sense of what can and has uh, the capacity to happen. So I just want to say a really heartfelt thank you. We would sort of give you a cup of coffee and maybe a toasty but we can't do anything of the kind this morning so we can just <laughs> wave you from your way and wish you a good day now well, look I, honestly it's brilliant then thank you i've uh, really enjoyed it could have been um, we could have gone on for hours we certainly could thank you very much have a good day everyone take care cheers